I'm Gemma Etchells, a solicitor in private practice, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the recent changes in will drafting, some updates that you may wish to consider, and then secondly, in relation to the validity of wills and certain challenges which can occur to try and attack the validity of a will. This is an interesting subject in itself, and I'll be looking at some of the recent case law on this matter, which has shown up new challenges, which there may be to wills, and something that you might like to have regard to in practice. So firstly, looking at will drafting and providing an update on this. I'll be looking at some of the recent um, changes in the legislation, and then looking at some case law on this which has brought about some changes. I'm not going to be providing a list of clauses which you should be inserting in wills, but um, rather giving you an overview of some issues which you might like to consider, and then you can take these back to your practice, consider them and use them as appropriate, incorporating them into your own precedent. It is an area that one has to constantly look at and consider due to the changes not only in the case law but also in the budgetary regime and different tax advantages, disadvantages and just differences in the legislation. So it's something that you should be looking at constantly, reviewing precedents and advising and training other staff in your office on these aspects. As such, it is um, a great topic and um, something that can provide you with a lot of marketing opportunities to your clients. They will provide you with opportunities to inform them of recent changes in the um, budget, etc. And to advise them, if appropriate, of contacting you with a view to perhaps changing or updating or just looking over their will again. So it is a great topic in that respect. So firstly, I want to look at discretionary trusts. Now, these were extremely popular and um, they gained great popularity after the 1971 case of Macphail and Dalton, which extended the class of possible beneficiaries so you could use them much more widely in practice. One of their main uses was in relation to nil rate um, ban discretionary trusts for spouses and others and this has dropped in popularity due to the transferable nil rate band which was changed in um, last year's budget so they have ceased to be popular somewhat but they still do have um, good uses in practice and one should consider these um, such a use could possibly be to protect vulnerable beneficiaries of an estate um, such as if you've got somebody who is likely to be benefiting from the estate, who your client wants to benefit from the estate, who um, may be suffering from some disability, um, physical or some mental disability. Also, um, they might be useful for perhaps recovering alcoholics um, who are going to benefit from the estate. So there are certain uses for them. Um, another use might be for those who are potentially going to suffer financial difficulties who are wanting to be a beneficiary of an estate. Um, those perhaps who are suffering in these present climates, um, perhaps business difficulties, they may be um, looking at insolvency or, or different things like that. Or perhaps somebody who is going to be named as a beneficiary who is going through a divorce and um, you know, it may help to have them named in the discretionary trust in a will um, so that it doesn't impact on the divorce proceedings. This um, obviously is something that needs to be constantly considered in relation to beneficiaries, to changes in beneficiaries and changing circumstances of beneficiaries. But I don't think that discretionary trusts should just be um, put aside, cast aside because of what happened in the budget. There are definite uses for them. Another um, good use for them is to protect the estate from care home fees. 
Um, I know this is something that more and more clients are becoming wary of and something that they often want to consider and discuss um, with a solicitor when they, uh, when they come in to, to talk to you about a will. So they may have uses in that respect also. And also um, another use for them could be perhaps where minors um, are going to benefit from an estate and what would usually happen is you'd usually put a clause in saying that the parent or guardian of this person would give a good receipt for money. But perhaps the client doesn't want that to happen. The um, parent or guardian might be um, not getting on very well with the client for various reasons, divorce, or, or they might have problems themselves, and the client may not want that. So discretionary trust can be used in that respect also. I'm sure you can think of other um, instances that you've had that um, you have used them as well um, in in um, practice. But it is something that you shouldn't just cast aside. It is something very important to, to still consider, and they still do have their use. So um, moving on to transferable nil rate ban legacies. Um, the Chancellor, when he um, announced this, it was widely reported as he had um, doubled the inheritance tax nil rate ban. Of course, he did no such thing. Um, those times he was, he was more interested perhaps in inheritance tax um, rather than uh, spending taxpayers' money on saving the banks as he is now, but he still didn't do any such thing. He didn't increase um, the uh, inheritance tax ban by uh, 100%. He um, rather announced that from the 9th of October 2007, spouses and civil partners will be able to transfer their nil rate inheritance tax ban allowance that wasn't used on the first death to their spouse on their subsequent death. Now, this is wide ranging and has been used in a number of instances. Firstly, um, one thing to note is that it does predate the current inheritance tax regime, so you can go back as, as, you know, as far as possible um, to claim it back. Um, there might be some problems there in tracing all the documentation in relation to the first death, which you, you might want to consider um, trying to locate all this documentation together. You might want to advise your clients of that if you got a client in your office who has come to you asking about this because their spouse or civil partner has died. You might want to advise them to keep all this documentation together so that they can use it on their subsequent death. Um, in that respect, it will be difficult and it will be um, a certain aspect where you'll have to turn detective. Um, but something that we should be bearing in mind now to keep all paperwork um, available for if clients want to um, use this later on. Um, if a spouse died two years ago, four years ago, for example, um, and they only used 50% of the nil rate ban then. Um, regardless of what the inheritance tax threshold was at that time, their spouse will be able to use 50% increase on the current inheritance tax ban. So it's done on a percentage basis, not on the actual figure that was outstanding. Now, um, as I said, there's no time limit for this. The, um, for when the first death occurred. The only thing that you must consider um, in relation to civil partnerships is that the first death must occur on or after the 5th of December 2005 when the Civil Partnership Act was entered into. Um, parties to this have to be married or civil partners. They can't be cohabitees or um, common law spouses or anything like that. They must either be civil partners or spouses. They must also have had a marriage which is recognised in England and Wales. So they can't have had some sort of religious blessing or ceremony that wasn't legally binding. So that might be also something that you want to check on if a client is wanting to use this perhaps in their estate or the beneficiaries or the um, personal representatives or executors are wanting to use it on an estate in which um, they are acting. Um, now, nil rate band can be transferred from more than one spouse. So um, if somebody has had two or three marriages, 
if the um, Nilmate band wasn't used um, by their former partners, um, former spouses, and they died leaving some, they can get this and they can accrue it, the 30%, which is unused on um, the death of their first husband, then another 30% on the death of their second husband, and so on. But it can only add up to 100%. You can only get a 100% uplift. You can never get any more than that. So um, some people will therefore say that um, discretionary trusts, which incorporated a nil rate tax ban between spouses, are therefore irrelevant. Yes, they are, but it doesn't mean that the will is invalid and it therefore has to be totally rewritten, not at all. So um, you shouldn't be marketing that to your clients as such. You can say that there's no need for this in their current will because of um, legislation has preceded this, um, but you should... Um, you shouldn't be advertising it and marketing as clients as they need to come in and change their will. That would be totally incorrect. Um, but again, nil rate ban discretionary trusts can still be utilised in very good instances and for certain purposes. Um, they can be used in the following instances, for example. If um, the survivor were to inherit the whole estate, and then they perhaps went on to remarry and then make another will, leaving everything to the second husband, for example, then all the assets from the first husband's estate would pass to the wife and then on to the second husband's family if the wife didn't make provision for anybody related to um, the first husband. Now, you might not want that. You might want to um, involve some relatives of yours. And in that respect, the nil rate ban discretionary trust can be utilised to good effect. It's also another vehicle, as I've said, um, to help in relation to averting um, care home fees. And um, another thing you might want to consider is if a survivor inherits um, a large amount outright, then they might be subject to influence, shall we say, about how to utilise this. Um, so you might want to have a, um, a, a nil rate ban discretionary trust to help in this regard. And um, if there are sufficient liquid assets, it might still be advantageous to set up a nil rate ban from which the um, survivor can benefit. Capital growth in the trust may outstrip any um, increase in the nil rate band over the survivor's lifetime. So you have to look at that. You have to look at the legislation as it, um, as it grows, because as, as has been seen, the legislation is constantly changing. So whatever may be applicable previously, which might have been utilised to good effect then, due to the change in the legislation, unfortunately, it might all change again. Um, the time limit for bringing a claim under this is 24 months after the end of the month in which the second um, person died or three months um, beginning with the date on which the personal representative first acted, whichever is the greater. Um, dispensations can be given for out-of-time applications, but this is at the virtue of revenue and customs. This means that technically the trustees of a trust that is liable to inheritance tax following the death of the life tenant cannot make a claim until two years have passed. Something that you might want to consider if anybody else is wanting to, to bring a claim under this. Um, so as I've said, it does depend somewhat on how the legislation grows and how it amends as to what vehicle you should be using. As such, I am a great believer that post-death variations are not used enough. This is the only way that um, you can really look at an estate and consider what is best. A post-death variation can be made up to two years after the date of death. Now, this gives the perhaps if it's um, a surviving spouse, time to actually look at the estate of their um, deceased husband or wife. 
and gives them time to consider what they need to live on if they need to move out of the house, if they can't manage there or they don't want to stay there. It might release some um, liquid assets which they then might want to um, do pets with or something like that. And it can really be used for the um, tax plan of both spouses and can be used to great effect. I think that trusts do have their um, place in tax planning and um, will drafting, but you've got to consider your client. If your client comes in and um, it's a husband and wife, say for example, and the husband um, wants a trust, he knows everything about it, he, um, he deals with finances, he knows what he's talking about, but the wife is sat there and she's not too sure, she's concerned if he were to die first, what would she be left with, would there be charges from revenue and customs, really to, to tie them up in, in a trust is not really the best um, for the client, it's not acting in their best interest and you could be left with a lot of mess to sort out with afterwards because they will undoubtedly come back to you to sort it out. Um, so a post-death variation is something where everybody can sit back, look at it and consider what wants to be done, what needs to be done and um, they can take time over this. They've got 24 months to do it from the date of death. The only thing is um, that you must advise your clients on is that they have 24 months to do this but they've only got one bite at the cherry. They, can, they can't do a post-death variation six months from the date of death and then another one 18 months. Um, they've only got one chance to do it. So they can really consider all the assets and use it in this regard. Now, post-death variations, some people have stated that um, they might go out um, with any new tax regime that comes in. Of course, this could be said for any aspect, and it's again something which you're going to have to consider and um, keep your clients updated on. So it is something that you, you, could, you should be using, I think, and you should be consider using, but as always, keep your eye out about it because it might be subject to change. Now, um, the other biggest impact that there has been um, in relation to will drafting and wills and probates and um, practitioners is the Civil Partnership Act, which came into force on the 5th of December 2005. Now, this states that any um, exemptions for spouses also applies to civil partners. Um, one aspect which you should be considering, which has caused um, quite a few problems um, at the probate registry is on oaths which are sent in by executives or PRs. Um, if the, um, the client, the deceased um, client has um, divorced, say, and then in your oath you have to put that they haven't remarried, you also have to put that they haven't remarried or entered into a civil partnership. If you don't, it will get um, sent back to you from the probate registry and you'll have to resubmit it and just go through the problems of that again. So you just have to have regard to wherever you're putting um, wife, husband, spouse, you have to refer to civil partners as well. Um, this means that in, um, in any of your precedents and things like that, you should be looking through that and you should really have already done it, but it is something to consider and to advise the whole firm on because... Um, fee earners may be aware of this but secretaries might not and some precedents that they're using they just need to be aware of this and really consider it in the whole context of um, the practice as with any update that happens um, through the um, legislation or um, through case law. Um, now I want to look at business wills. This is something which um, is not often addressed but in the present climate, people with small businesses, um, sole traders, they may be worried about their business, what would happen if they were to die, and they might be coming to you to offer some advice um, rather than perhaps going to a, you know, a, a very expensive um, outfit or, or make, taking um, details instructions from their accountant. Of course they should be seeing their accountant in relation to this but it is something that you might want to consider and in this present climate it will give you another marketing opportunity. So um, if an absolute gift of a business is given, the goodwill, goodwill sorry, stock, 
assets, book debts, then this will be subject to 100% business property relief and tax will have to be considered um, as it could be seen that a gift of a business should be given free of tax and um, then in the event of inheritance tax being payable um, then the business might want to be able to pay it in instalments so that some of the trade um, and the trade profit that they generate can be used to pay off the um, inheritance tax bill. Um, if you, a gift of a business is made, then liabilities will also pass with the gift um, of the business. Um, these, however, do not include the um, testator's income tax liability on the business's profits unless express directions are given to this effect. So you might want to consider that. And of course, your client will know best about the business, what they want to pass, but you're just giving them some ideas to think about, some considerations. Um, as with any aspect, you should be making full file notes on this so that you can retain them on your file um, for future consideration. Um, a gift of a business will also include the gift of any um, property from which the business runs. Um, so unless this is specifically excluded, this will also include that. So it's something that you should make your clients aware of, perhaps if they are using um, parts of a house which they reside in for the business or um, some other property in their portfolio which they want to pass differently. So you must consider that and also one other careful consideration is if the business premises are leasehold, which um, often they are, um, you might want to put a clause in the will stating that all the covenants will be performed by the beneficiary. Now this will depend somewhat on when the lease was acquired, whether it was um, before or after 1996 with the introduction of the Land and Tenant Covenants Act 1995, because obviously if it was post-1996, this probably won't be needed, but you just want to have a look into that. In relation to premises from which the business is running, you might also want to um, consider, in relation to the whole issue of property, whether any um, business debts are secured over any other property or assets which the client may own. It might be that in the present times they're looking at different financing opportunities and um, availability to them of these issues. So you might want to have something where um, if, say, a business debt is secured over their main home, that this is discharged out of the business before this asset passes to the intended beneficiary. For example, somebody may own a business, um, let's say it's um, a printing business with um, their business partner. They want this to pass to their business partner on their death, but um, the asset, um, some of the business assets um, are secured over some of the business debts are secured over their um, main residence which they own with their wife they want this to pass to their wife their home if any business debts are secured over this it will be most appropriate for the debts to be discharged out of the business because obviously the wife wants to get the house free of any debts in relation to the business because she will have nothing to do with the business so um, you might want to make provision for that. And even if it isn't the case at the moment where your client does have that, it might be something that they would do in the future. So you might want to put a clause in there to protect them and their beneficiaries. At least discuss it because otherwise um, beneficiaries could come back to you if um, it does cause a problem and it's, it's not what um, the testator wanted. Um, you might also want to put in there um, a right to inherit the business if it changes its name or, um, or any part of it, something, something like that. Um, certain powers will also be necessary to be granted to the trustees um, in a business will. Um, 
certain of these could be um, power to incorporate the business, power to carry on or discontinue the business, power to employ a manager or delegate powers of the business, um, power to use assets other than business assets, um, power to carry on the business in partnership with somebody else, power to employ other professionals perhaps to carry it on if um, it was a professional business such as indeed a solicitor's or a, a dentist or, or something like that. So you might want to also look at that. It is um, an area which is very interesting and it is something that um, you, know, you know solicitors can offer which is good um, for their practice development and for marketing opportunities. It's just a lot of considerations to take on board, but I think um, even with the recession, there are a lot of small businesses in England and Wales, and this is something that solicitors should really be considering and offering. Now, in relation to the recession, which I've just touched upon, this is affecting people's wills, no doubt. Um, people perhaps um, who have got a large share portfolio may find that what was once worth £7,000 um, if they might have had shares in, say, Lloyd's um, TSB, now under the Lloyd's Banking Group, those shares might be worth, say, £500. If they've left those shares to somebody, um, a relative, then what the um, relative is getting is obviously... Um, lesser than what they first intended so clients might want to reconsider that or they might take the view that it is a risk but if um, the relative who inherits it um, wants to keep the um, shares then they might rise and it's a bit of a gamble but I think um, in view of recent market conditions and what we've seen we should be advising clients more than ever to continually review their wills, look at them, see if what they wanted to happen is still happening, if, um, if their assets have changed, then other um, tax planning initiatives, different schemes might be better to them, and other um, assets that they want to leave to beneficiaries might be increased or changed. So that is a marketing tool, of course, that you can use. And it is something that I think we should be considering. And if a client comes into you and says, I want to leave all my shares in the um, Lloyd's banking group to my niece, then you should just be saying to them, you are aware that um, these can go up and down. Of course, you can't give financial advice, but just to advise them on their whole estate and the basis of it, how it may change and fluctuate, I think is a consideration which you should be um, paying regard to at least and then um, speaking to clients about. Now I'm going to look at some recent cases which um, have brought up some very interesting points and may affect the work of the private client practitioner. Um, so firstly, the 2008 case of Smith and um, HMRCC. This was in relation to annuities, life policies and medical evidence. Now, as well as um, post-death variations, I am another great proponent of um, life policies because um, life policies written for the um, benefits of um, say, somebody's children or partner pass outside of the um, outside of their estate they don't become um, liable or even a question of inheritance tax and no question is raised over these and they pass quite quickly compared to how dependent on obviously the size of the estate they don't have to be administered through the estate so it's something that I think is um, very useful and you should be speaking to clients about just paying regard to it when perhaps you're speaking to them about their um, whole assets um, that they've got to consider in their estate. So um, this case concerned annuities, life policies and medical evidence, as I've said. Um, now, it was a very, very odd case to say the same. Um, it concerned the purchase of an annuity and a life policy where the policy was written for uh, the benefit of another person rather than the purchaser. 
Now, in these instances, unless it can be shown that the purchase of these two is not connected, the purchaser will be treated as having made a transfer of value. However, statement of practice E4 states that these are not to be treated as a transfer of value if the policy was issued on the provision of full medical evidence. Now, it turned on the fact of what was full medical evidence. Now, um, Mr. and Mrs. Smith had both um, taken out these policies. Um, I think it was Mr. Smith, um, both of them had to fill in a questionnaire about um, their medical history, but Mr. Smith had to go for a full medical. Mrs. Smith didn't, she just filled in the form. So it was seen as, as what medical evidence was filling in the form, in the case of Mrs. Smith, sufficient, or did you have to go for a full medical, as in the case of Mr. Smith? Now, it was seen in this case that um, where someone merely completes a form, this will not suffice as medical evidence. So it's something that you might be wanting to perhaps speak about with clients if it comes up about the issue of life policies and annuities um, and medical evidence. If something like that does come up, then do look back at this case and just advise them on that respect because they might um, think that it's just passing outside the estate, not liable to any taxation, when perhaps that might not be the case. So that's um, one case to perhaps consider. Um, then in relation to another 2008 case, Ogden and others was the case. Now, um, this again was an extremely interesting case concerning potentially exempt transfers and the potential to set these aside. Yes, um, indeed, um, a consideration that some people might seem at odds. Now, this case um, became apparent because um, the testator had made pets in April 2003 and February 2004. Now he'd made these with the intention of surviving for seven years. But I think every client who makes a pet, anybody who makes a pet always makes them with the intention of surviving seven years. You, you do run the risk, I think, of when you make any pets, whether you will run the risk of surviving seven years. And you should be advising clients on this. They could make a pet and then we run over by a bus the next day, in which case it's a failed pet, but they still made it with the intention of surviving. But um, this case turned on the fact that the pets were made in April 2003 and February 2004. And then in autumn 2004, the testator was diagnosed with lung cancer. It um, was seen in this case that because he made it the pets with the intention of surviving the seven years, that um, a if a mistake of fact is sufficiently serious, it can invoke the equitable jurisdiction to set aside voluntary transactions. Now, um, he was seen in this case to be suffering from lung cancer, it was, which was diagnosed in autumn 2004, when the second pet was made in February 2004 and um, therefore that pet was set aside. Um, it wasn't utilised to be set aside against the first pet which he made in April 2003 because it was seen that when he made that he wasn't um, suffering with lung cancer. So um, I think this is a very interesting case. It's interesting that um, it only was brought about because um, if the pet had not been made, there'd be no um, liability to inheritance tax. Um, I think it's a very wide ranging case and um, we'll have to see how it opens the floodgates to other um, cases of this sort and, and what, um, what it will bring in the future. I think it's interesting that it um, seemed to invoke the equitable jurisdiction to set aside transactions and don't know if that would be um, available to be brought in every case, but it's something um, to consider. Also in this case, it was very telling that um, Revenue and Customs didn't want to um, be involved in the case. They asked if they wanted to object, but they didn't. So I don't quite know what was happening there, but um, it does seem that there is the potential to set aside um, pets. So it's something that you might want to consider. I think when any client comes in and you're talking about pets, then you have to make them aware of the um, seven-year time 
um, limit on it, but, you know, to, to survive seven years to make it fully, fully work. Um, and I don't know how successful you might be in bringing a, uh, another challenge against this, but we'll have to see what the future holds. Um, then looking to the European courts, um, now there have been challenges um, about certain inheritance tax legislation um, where land or assets in one country form part of a deceased estate in another. Now, it does seem to blur the boundary about what um, assets can be included in a, a will in relation to international assets and it's perhaps something that you might want to think about in the future but um, it does seem to um, leave open to challenge the use of agricultural property relief so that it can be utilised more widely across Europe. Um, also I think this may bring into challenge the restriction on the spousal exemption of non-domiciled EU nationals um, because in relation to free movement and, and free movement of, of um, trade and, and fiscal matters, I think there are some potential challenges there. So that might be something that um, you might want to consider as well. These are in certain instances where a client would come in um, and ask you about these. They've got to have property abroad, for example. But I think that um, you should be paying reference to this and just advising them about the the potential challenges or the potential case law which has come to light just so that they are aware and of course file note it. Um, now I'll be looking at the validity of wills in the second part of this presentation um, but this is one of the final cases I'm going to touch on of 2008 which um, I think was very interesting in respect to validity of wills and in relation to will drafting about codicils, etc. Um, in this case, Hall Trustees of 2008, the testatrix made one will in 1999. She then added a codicil to this in January 2000. In August 2000, she made a second will, um, revoking all earlier wills and codicils, as would um, be a standard clause in, in any will. And um, this would generally be seen to be sufficient, even if the first will hadn't been destroyed, she had revoked it. Um, however, problems arose um, four years later in 2004, when a second codicil was made to the first will. So, in this respect, you've got a will made in 1999, first codicil in January 2000, second codicil in 2004. But you've got this second will which comes in between the first and the second codicil. So it's which will is valid um, and the case was brought and it was seen that by adding a second codicil to the first will, this was her last action in September 2004 before she died, that um, she was um, invoking the first will and utilising that. So it's a consideration um, to have. And I think in, when anybody comes in to, you, to ask you to draft a will, you should be asking them about their um, other wills. If they have been revoked, are they aware of this? Where are they? Have they been destroyed? And again, um, noting it for your file notes. So um, looking at the area of um, wills, and will drafting updates, some considerations. Um, discretionary trusts, uh, we can see, um, are not as uh, popular as they once were after the 1970s case of McPhail and Dalton, but they do have their certain uses. The transferable nil rate bans has been welcomed by many practitioners as easing um, the burden on them, making um, will drafting easier, more accessible, to um, clients for, for what they want, but only in relation to spouses and um, civil partners. So transferable um, nil rate banned um, discretionary trusts are still um, very much in force. They um, are, do have their place extremely, um, as we can see in, in many, many cases, and um, they should be utilised to good effect. You shouldn't just turn your back on them. Um, the Civil Partnership Act has added um, extra considerations for any will drafter 
and I think that um, this is something that you should be considering in relation to any will um, or any probate or any documentation that you've got, not only in relation to wills and inheritance tax and probate, but also for, to be honest, family and matrimonial departments, you should really be on the ball with that, especially now. Um, business wills, um, I've looked at and considered what you, you might be thinking about in that regard, advising clients on and, and noting down as your advice. And then I've briefly looked at um, some case law of 2008, which shows that not all the cases are influenced by the Finance Act, and um, you should be keeping up to date with case law and looking how that may impact on not only will drafting, but also on advice to clients and advising clients of the impacts of this in relation to any um, tax planning initiatives they might want to be using. Um, I think that the best thing to advise anybody in this respect is to keep reviewing matters, looking at legislation, case law and advising clients accordingly. It gives you great marketing opportunities and um, you should be looking at the full range of opportunities available to all clients to advise them fully. Now, um, just finishing off, I want to look at the area of um, powers of attorneys, um, which I think is something, again, for any will drafter, which um, you should be speaking to clients about, advising them on, and it's another marketing opportunity. Um, so we've got the EPAs, um, which um, were bought, which were utilised before the Mental Capacity Act of 2005. Those are still in force. Um, the onus is on the attorneys to register them if um, it's seen that the person who these are made in favour of is becoming mentally incapable. So it's something there where the onus is on the attorney. Um, these were very simple, I think four, five page forms at maximum. Then um, these were replaced after the Mental Capacity Act of 2005 came in force by the LPAs, which were um, tomes, shall we say, multiple documents, multiple pages, which um, I know when they first landed on my desk, my heart sank looking at them. But um, you've got the two forms for the LPAs. You've got the um, one in relation to personal welfare and the one in relation to property and financial matters. So I think they are better. They do provide much better protection. Um, as they'd have to be registered um, with the Office of the Public Guardian um, before they can even be utilised, where EPAs didn't. They were only, um, they were only registered once the um, donor becomes mentally incapable, and at that stage they have the big blue stamp on them from the OPG. So um, you've now got the two LPAs. Um, some people, the press, I think, you know, when I say some people, jumped on the bandwagon when the LPAs came in in relation to personal welfare and said that this one was um, really letting uh, backdoor euthanasia in and etc. But um, in the Mental Capacity Act, it does state that um, nothing would um, in the Act would allow that in relation to the Suicide Act, so I think that um, has been disregarded. I think um, the Personal Welfare LPA does have its use for perhaps those with certain religious beliefs, um, Jehovah's Witness, etc. Um, but I think that their use, their use will be um, lesser than the um, Property and Affairs um, LPA. I think also if any solicitor is being asked um, to act as um, an attorney in a um, Property and Affairs LPA, they will probably be quite willing to do so. In relation to a personal affairs, um, I, I know I wouldn't um, particularly want to be um, involved in that. Um, I don't mind people's finances, but their personal um, welfare perhaps is a different matter. So um, looking briefly at LPAs, you um, there are better um, ways in these that um, protection is provided. Firstly, you've got to have a certificate provider, provide a certificate stating that the um, donor has entered into this and they are um, mentally capable of doing so, they are aware of all um, the aspects of this. And this can either be a Category A or a Category B certificate provider. 
Um, solicitors will fall into one of these categories and you can provide a certificate if you want to do such. Um, now, it is a concern over um, conflict of interest and, and how widely a solicitor can be filling in the form, acting as a certificate provider, advising the client, witnessing signatures, etc. And I think you've got to look at the guidance for careful consideration on those points because I think it is a, a distinction which um, could be blurred. And I think that um, perhaps the certificate provider, you know, you know, you've got to really consider your role in the transaction in the instructions. So I think that is um, something that you should consider. Um, I think one of the most important points um, that the um, new LPA brought in was that with the old EPAs, when they were registered, you had to inform certain classes of um, relatives of the donor um, that the registration was going to take place and you had to um, let them have the right to object for a certain period of time before the registration would go through. In the new LPAs, um, the um, person entering into the LPA actually names the people who they want to be told of the um, registration. So I think in that respect they have more control over the whole process. If they don't want to name anybody to be um, told of the registration, then they have to have two certificate providers. So it does show the core element of the form really is this, I think, in my opinion. So um, you've, got to, um, you, you've got to have regard to that area. Um, so in relation to LPAs, another issue which is very important is whether um, attorneys are appointed jointly or severally or jointly and severally. Um, if nothing is stated in this regard, then it will be seen as they are to be acting jointly. If they can't make joint decisions, then um, unfortunately the LPA is invalid because they can't, they can't work together um, and they can't use the form. So I think it is important that every solicitor must make um, the correct allocation on this form, they should never leave it blank, they should make sure they fill it in correctly, taking advice from their clients and advising their clients on all the implications of this. Um, also in relation to um, who is to be appointed as attorney, um, if somebody wants to appoint their spouse or civil partner, they can do so of course, but if they then later become divorced or um, separated, then unfortunately um, the EPA, so the LPA will be um, invalid if they are to be acting jointly. So I think it is something that you should be considering and um, perhaps in certain instances um, advising clients about the wider use of the points um, jointly and severally. The um, LPAs do have um, greater area for advice um, which the, um, which the uh, clients can be putting in if they want to in relation to certain property and affairs which they are using. Um, I think LPAs are, have not been met with um, a great deal of success. I think one of the issues is the cost element because um, before they can be utilised they have to be registered um, for a, quite a handsome sum in relation to both forms. If you, if you are submitting two forms you have to pay two lots of fees. The forms obviously are much more lengthy and um, solicitors are obviously charging much more for filling them in and completing them. Um, the one thing is that you can of course have, um, have your clients um, do an LPA and then it just sit there until they want to use and at that point then it is registered so they can defer some of the cost in that respect which you, you could be advising them on. Um, of course it's not as simple as the EPA and um, there are some firms I know which are looking at different powers of attorneys um, which wouldn't be utilised in the case of um, insanity or any um, issues with mental capacity but they can be utilised in relation to specific transactions for example property transactions 
and I think solicitors are more happy to be named on them for acting for a client in those regard. So that is something as well that you should be considering. I think that in the whole area of um, wills, will drafting, probate, LPAs, EPAs, there's a lot um, there's a lot of work there to be to be grabbed at and to be um, to be given to any practitioner and clients will come back to you for different advice on different aspects um, once they have an established relationship with you. So it is really worth investing in that. And um, I think in any of these areas, you've really got to um, bear in mind the Solicitor's Code of Conduct because unfortunately, when you are dealing with um, elderly people generally making wills, there is the um, inference that perhaps um, you, they might have been more influenced by undue influence or different, different aspects um, competing on them. So I think that you've got to take great care in this respect and um, really make um, detailed file notes to protect yourself, to protect your firm. Um, from any negligence claims in the future. So I think that is something that you've got to consider um, and making file notes is the best way to do that. I think um, you should be updating precedents and looking over them continually, looking at how um, clients are wanting advice, what areas they're wanting advice on and um, training staff and um, really trying to provide the best of personal service as you can to the client using all the tools that your firm has. So um, that's all I've got to say on the area of um, a will drafting update. I'll be moving on to the challenges to the validity of wills, which is the next aspect I'm going to be looking at, which just reinforces really the need to um, take proper file notes, proper instructions from your client, detailed, so that if there is ever a challenge to the validity of the will, you um, can produce these and hopefully these will help if any challenges are raised in this respect. I'm going to now be looking at possible challenges to the validity of a will. Now, um, if you are unfortunate to be in a position where there is a potential challenge to a validity of the will, you will have to consider various aspects on which a will can be challenged. And um, these concern, firstly, um, the capacity of the test data. There may then be challenges as to whether the will was executed correctly. Then people may look at whether there was a want of knowledge of approval by the testator when entering into the will. And they may also consider whether there was any undue influence at play and um, try to challenge on this ground. And lastly, they may also try to look at the issue of forgery and whether the will is a forgery or whether it is valid. So those are the five grounds on which a will is generally um, challenged. Now, looking at these points in turn and some other um, key considerations, I'll hopefully give an overview as the potential challenges that can be made against a will and look at some of the recent cases in this regard which um, have either upheld or overturned a point. Um, so firstly, looking at the capacity of the test data, which um, is possibly the most important point. The classic test um, for this is contained in the Banks and Goodfellow case. Um, this stated that um, in order to be seen as showing having the requisite capacity to enter into the will, the testator must understand the following. Firstly, they must understand the nature of the act and its effects of making the will what the will will do. They must also have um, regard to the extent of their property. They must know what their property involves. They don't need to know um, their exact bank balance. I know I don't, they don't need to know um, what, um, 
what they have in each bank account. They just need to know the, the main aspects, so that the house, they have savings with this, if they have any shares. Obviously, if, if one or a couple of things are, are missed out or wrong valuations are given, then I, I think this, um, this is okay. I think if they were to um, miss out um, a, a, a large property that they had and they just visited a couple of days ago, a holiday home, then this may raise issues about capacity. Um, and they should also be able to have regard to the, um, the people who they ought to be regarding in making a will. This doesn't mean that the will has to make regard to those people, but um, they have to have um, knowledge of these people. Um, they have to um, know that they've got children. They can't have forgotten they've got children if you've asked them, have they, um, have they got any children? If they say no and you know they've got children, then that is a, a blatant challenge to the capacity of a will. But if you've asked them, have they got any children who would like to benefit? And they say, we have, but um, we don't get on with them. We're providing for them in other ways. We don't um, believe they should benefit um, through our estate. They should stand on their own two feet. Um, as was the case in Anita Roddick's will, um, then that is fine. They just need to know of the people who typically um, may have a claim on their estate or who they should be um, making regard to in their will. Um, in addition, they should also not be suffering or under the influence of any delusions which may affect the terms of their will. Delusions of any other kind, um, if, they, um, if they have any other delusions of grandeur or delusions of who they are or what's going on in the world, as long as it doesn't affect their will um, and the above points, then um, capacity is intact. So that's the classic test of Banks and Goodfellow, which um, sets down what is needed um, for capacity to be shown in making the will. If um, this if any of these points are not shown, um, then of course it will give a blatant and um, rise to a, a lack of capacity. So I think when anybody is going to, to see a client or a client's coming into the office to take instructions, they should be um, looking at these points um, and discussing with them, asking them um, what is the size and nature of your estate, um, who who would have claim to your estate, who do you want to have regard to, who do you not want to have regard to. And I think you should be covering yourself there. I think once that is, is achieved, then you've gone some way to, to show that the um, testator had capacity to enter into the will. Of course, um, it's something that you should be considering for your own um, regard. You don't want to claim with negligence against yourself, against a firm. Um, so as well as protecting the clients, and um, the beneficiaries of the estate, um, I'll come on later as to whether they have a claim against you, then you should be um, really looking into all these points. So that's the classic Banks and Goodfellow test, which is used widely um, to show capacity. This was recently added to by the Mental Capacity Act of 2005, which assesses capacity. Um, it states, firstly, in section 1, subsection 2, a person must be assumed to have capacity unless proved otherwise. So from that point, it seems to be we're starting not rather a test of capacity to see whether somebody has capacity, it's rather seen that they have capacity and then they have to show us that they don't. So it's, it's, a, it's quite a hard test, I think. Um, secondly, in um, section 2, subsection 1, a person would lack capacity in relation to a matter if at the material time they are unable to make a decision for themselves due to an impairment of or a disturbance in the functioning of the mind or brain. So that is really the lack of capacity test which is seen in this act. So that is key section two, subsection one. Um, thirdly, a person should not be treated as incapable of making a decision because their decision might seem unwise, um, or they should not also be seen as making, um, not seen as having a lack of capacity unless all reasonable steps have been made to help them um, make this decision. So um, this might 
make the solicitors doing a home visit go back and visit them again because if you haven't made all reasonable steps to assess whether they have capacity you might be seen as being negligent so it's something that um, you should be having regard to these points in the mental capacity acts as well um, as, as the banks and good fellow test now if somebody doesn't have capacity um, a application can be made for a statutory will to be made but um, this is quite um, restrictive. They can't um, do a lot with a statutory will, and it's quite a costly process because it involves the um, obviously the public guardian. It's quite a time-consuming process as well. So um, it's something that can be done, um, but it won't be um, it won't be very very wide-ranging. Um, an instance which might um, be shown as an example of this is perhaps if, um, say, a husband and wife um, had married and then they hadn't divorced but had um, gone through a judicial separation due to um, religious grounds, um, and then they'd lived separately, never had contact for the next um, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, depending upon the, the type of judicial separation or separation that they'd had. If they hadn't um, divorced, then this, um, then they would both be, um, if they died intestate, would both get each other's estate, and perhaps that might not be what they want um, if they have um, children from any subsequent relationship or anything like that. So, of course, those children could be able to make a... Um, an application under the um, Inheritance um, Provision for Dependents Act, which I'll come on to later. But that's that's the sort of case which perhaps the Office of the Public Guardian might look into where they make a statutory will, but it's, it's, it's not certain and it's not going to be wide-ranging. So any use of that has to be used with caution. So um, as you've seen in the capacity test, it's a functional test and it's um, made with reference to the testator's ability to carry out the particular task of understanding the information relevant to the decision, retaining that information and being able to communicate that decision, communicate it either verbally or um, in writing or some other means or sign language or something like that. They've got to be able to communicate as well. Um, so. It, it isn't a precise art in um, defining capacity and some solicitors will um, be cautious about being involved in this decision. We're not um, medical practitioners, we're not um, able to really assess somebody's capacity. Um, so I think it can be an area where perhaps some solicitors might approach it with some sort of, of trepidation or concern that they don't want to just be making themselves liable and open to negligence claims in the future. So um, I think it's something that um, we should be really concerned about and cautious over and most particularly making the um, necessary file notes to, to back up one's position. So um, capacity, if one has capacity, when does the capacity have to be shown? Does the capacity have to be shown at the point when instructions were given or at the point of execution of the will? Now ideally they should be shown at both points because then there would be um, no um, concern or issue in relation to capacity. But um, in the case of Parker and Felgate, it was seen to be sufficient to show that the testator had capacity when the instructions were given to show capacity. As long as they had capacity when the instructions were given, that was fine. Um, they didn't necessarily have to have it when they were signing the will. Now, I think that really depends and turns upon a few points. Firstly, it depends on the time in between the instructions were given and the time when they execute the will. Of course, any person drawing up a will will want to keep that time frame as small as possible so that um, there might be no challenges to negligence for if a person was to die in between or something was to happen in between. So they want to keep that time frame as tight as possible. Um, so... Um, some people have um, raised concerns over this case about just showing capacity when instructions were given. 
but the Parker and Felgate decision was upheld in the more recent 2003 case of Clancy and Clancy. The the, sorry, the testatrix did not have capacity when the will was signed because um, she was, I think she was um, heavily sedated in hospital at the time, but she did have capacity when the instructions were given. Therefore, it was seen that the will was valid in relation to capacity. Um, as I've touched on before, making um, a decision in relation to capacity is not a, a cut and dried test. It's not easy for a solicitor. And um, some people, some solicitors, will drafters may want to um, get the opinion of a medical expert or some medical opinion in this regard. Um, and that was um, brought up as being the um, golden rule advocated um, by one of the judges in um, Re Simpson and Re Morris cases. So the golden rule is to get um, the, um, tes the testamentary capacity um, assessed by um, some medical evidence or opinion. Now, that, that's all good and well, but if a client um, refuses um, that a medical practitioner should be involved, um, should one a solicitor refuse to act? You might seem as though you should, but if the person did have um, capacity to make the will and you have refused to act, does um, this leave you open to a negligence claim? If you do have concerns about capacity, if you are putting this in writing to the client to advise them of such, will they understand this? Are you being negligent? Are you not acting in their best interests? It's, it's a, a really complicated area and um, there's no English authority on this at the moment. But in New Zealand, um, in a New Zealand case concerning this precise point where um, a medical practitioner, the, um, the client didn't want, didn't want the medical practitioner to be involved in assessing their capacity um, and the solicitor refused to act, in New Zealand they were found to be negligent. So um, I don't know how that would relate to English law and whether that would um, set a binding precedent over here. I think only time would tell. But it is... Um, it is a cause for concern, I think. Um, the best advice is just to tread carefully. Um, in the Re Morris and Re Simpson case um, about the golden rule of um, getting medical evidence, it was seen that if medical evidence shows that um, there isn't capacity to enter into a will, then um, you should not draft a will because in that instance you are then drafting a will which will knowingly lead to um, very expensive um, probate um, action and contentious probate action so you shouldn't be acting there but that's in the case where medical evidence was concerned. Um, in the 1999 case of Warby and Rosser it was um, further asked whether a solicitor, when they are drawing up a new will for a client, um, whether they owe a, um, a duty of care to a previous beneficiary under a former will um, to ensure that the um, testator has testamentary capacity, knowledge, approval of his consent, etc. Um, it was seen that in this case it was not, there was no such duty. It was seen by the Court of Appeal. Um, even if one follows all um, this guidance, they um, get um, medical opinion um, following the golden rule. Um, this issue of capacity by showing the capacity it doesn't necessarily mean that the will is therefore valid it can be challenged on another point but it is strong evidence um and um it, it is it is strongest evidence of um a valid will so i think it is a very important point to consider that you should be considering in relation to this and any other um aspect that you're instructed on by a client if they've got capacity to enter into the transaction conveyance in transaction any transaction is something that you should be considering um if one wants to challenge a will 
due to lack of capacity, then um, the test is a balance of probabilities test. And um, the person wanting to prove the will shall have the benefit of two presumptions. Um, and the first of those is that if the will is duly executed and appears to be rational, capacity will be presumed. So that brings us nicely on to the second point about due execution, who has seen that if um, the will is executed properly and um, rationally, then um, due capacity will be shown. So um, execution is, again, another key um, issue. And in the 2000 case of Sherrington and Sherrington, it was stated that the strongest evidence is required to rebut the presumption that proper execution will lead to a valid will. So, um, as I'm sure you're all aware, in relation, um, as shown in um, Section 9 of the Wills Act of 1837, wills have to be in a written format and signed in the presence of two independent witnesses. These people cannot be anybody named in the will, nor should they be spouses or indeed be civil partners of anybody named in the will either. The witnesses must both be present when the testator signs, but not necessarily when the witnesses sign, but generally all three will be together at the same time. Um, due to the influential nature of um, due um, execution, it's quite shocking really that um, no standard attestation clauses have ever been specified to be used. However, there will be standard, um, generally the same, used in, in many um, law firms up and down the country, but um, the standard format has never been approved. Um, up until 1983, um, wills had to be signed by the testator at the end of the will but um, now it's more relaxed although it will still generally be seen to the case that the signature will be at the end of the will. Um, wills however have been seen to be valid where the signature was um, over the other page from the contents of the will with no attestation clause. They've also been seen to be valid where um, the envelope was signed containing the will because there was seen to be proximity in relation to the will and the envelope. Um, and in one instance, I remember, they were also seen to be valid indeed where there was no signature, but rather somebody had started their will, my will of Joe Bloggs, and um, he hadn't signed it, but it was seen that um, he was... Um, intending it to take its effect by putting his name at the beginning. Of course, it's never advisable to do anything like that. As I touched on that case um, just a moment ago about where the envelope was signed and that was seen to be a um, valid will because of the proximity between the will and the envelope, um, care should be taken in relation to wills um, that... The, um, if it's on multiple pages, they're either bound together in some form um, so that you know that everything is together. And um, you should also advise your clients, perhaps when they are taking them away, um, not to affix anything to the will. You should have a standard form, um, which you should send out to clients, I think, stating that nothing should be fixed to the will, so it doesn't look as though there's a code is still attached to, which could later cause problems at the probate registry. Um, Wills can be written on any document, and um, quite interestingly, the following have all been seen to be acceptable forms um, to write a will on, um, although somewhat unconventional. Um, an eggshell, a wall, and a hologram have all been used to write your will on, but um, I think pen and paper will do as well. Um, so, also, um, in some instances, thumbprints, marks, unfinished signatures and signatures by the witnesses on behalf of and at the direction of the testator will also suffice. Um, if a will is read over to a blind or a visually impaired person, then a different attestation clause should be used than general, um, generally would be the case. It needs to state that the will was read over to um, the testator or the testatrix and that they signed after, um, after having it read over to them because um, 
generally one would um, expect the um, testator to read their own will and then sign it, not have it read over to them. Um, witnesses, um, as I stated before, witnesses need to be there when the testator signs, but they don't need to actually be in the presence when each other signs. Um, there will be um, a presumption of due execution um, if it's signed in relation, in, in relation to all the witnesses being there and the witnesses can testify that they signed it and the person seemed to be knowing what they were, what they were signing and it was a will, etc. Um, if the witnesses are led to believe that they're signing something else, then um, this would, I believe, um, give rise to a valid challenge against the validity of a will. This was seen in the case of um, Dr Shipman up in um, Hyde in the North West, um, the doctor who was um, convicted of multiple killings of um, his uh, clients, because I think for um, his first victim that he was trying against, I think it was Kathleen Grundy, he had changed her will so that um, he would benefit from her estate and had other patients in the practice witness this, but um, they later came forward as saying that they didn't believe it was a will they were witnessing, they thought it was some other document. So um, in those instances, um, one would um, give a rise to a valid challenge. Um, where wills are drafted by a firm and then sent away to be executed by the client, um, Great care must be taken over the instructions which you are giving to clients about how they should execute the will. And um, you should also give consideration after clients have um, executed a will, do you want it sent back to your firm to um, see it is being executed correctly? Because otherwise, could you be held negligent if it's not um, executed correctly? That's something that um, you might want to consider and look at your own um, practice and um, different considerations and guidelines within your firm. So the third issue which um, may be used against a challenge of a will is in relation to want of knowledge and approval. Now it's for the propounder of the will to show that the testator entered into a will with due knowledge and thus approving it. It's generally seen that um, where a testator signed a document um, as their will, due um, knowledge and approval will be seen because by their signature they're seeming, they're, they're seeming to give approval to it, so know, have knowledge of what it contains and approve it by putting their signature on the document. Um, Therefore, where a will is duly executed and there's no issues over the testator's capacity, um, really due knowledge and approval will be inferred and it would be a difficult challenge to show. Um, that's why when a challenge is um, brought under this um, head of want of knowledge and approval, it's often run with a claim of testamentary incapacity. Um, Many of the aspects challenging a will can be run together and often will be run together, but um, I, I think it's, it's a, a bad view to um, really just start on one point and bring another one in um, just to try and, and load up your case. I, I don't think that's really good practice um, for you to be using. Um, so, want of knowledge and approval is quite a simple one. I think it's a hard challenge to show if the um, testator signed the document because generally they'll be shown as having um, approved it and had knowledge of it by signing it. Um, the fourth aspect to look at is undue influence. Now, um, this is again an extremely hard um, challenge to show successfully as often undue influence will um, take place behind closed doors um, because especially in a probate case you have to show actual undue influence and it's the person who is making this claim which um, must satisfy this high evidential burden so it is, is a great challenge to make and it is a difficult one. Um, due to the potential pitfalls and negligence claims, it's advisable to see a client on their own. If they're an elderly client, then the daughter might bring them, um, if they've got um, mobility problems, etc. We should always ask to see the client on their own, ask them if they want to speak to you about anything, give them opportunities to do so, 
Um, and I think this can be, I don't think it has to be um, phrased in a way, you know, that you're suspicious of the other person bringing them and you want them out. I think it's just to, to cover your own back and cover them. And I think it can be approached in, in quite a positive way. So um, I think that's something um, to, to look at as well in every um, will instruction that you are taking. Um, the recent case, like it was last year, 2008 case of Hog and Hog, um, displayed the great difficulties that there are in bringing a cause of action under um, this, this um, area. This involved a claim by a brother that his sister had exerted undue influence over their father, which led to him being taken out of his will. Um, the judge stated in this case that um, there was no evidence that the testator um, entered into the will of his own, not of his own volition. Um, he did tr place um, great trust in his daughter. It was seen he lived with her and um, she she cared for him. But it was seen, um, looking uh, into the character of the deceased, that he was um, a man who took um, strong views and he was not averse on taking a strong dislike to a person and um, he didn't see any reason why he should have to make equal provision for his children in previous wills he hadn't done he had three children and left them different aspects in different wills different proportions of his estate although admittedly he'd always put all three in in some respect it was seen on looking back over this person's character there was no undue influence he favored his daughter um, in this case, he, he put great trust in her, um, he had a, a good relationship with her, but she didn't exert any undue influence over him. Because at the end of the day, it's got to be seen that anybody can leave their estate to whoever they want, and they've got to be able to do this. Um, and only if undue influence, actual undue influence is shown, will it be a valid challenge to this. Um, it is a heavy evidential burden. Um, which must be shown and in this recent case of hog and hog it wasn't and I think it is it is a difficult um, area to, to um, succeed in. Um, now I'll move on to the last aspect um, which can be um, used to, um, to challenge a will and that's in relation to um, forgery of a will. Forgery of a will is a serious allegation and um, there has been some debate about the standard of proof in these cases and it is to be shown on a balance of probabilities test. Now I think with the rise of do-it-yourself wills, um, write them at home, um, this issue could um, arise even more um, and I think that we might be seeing um, challenges by um, more beneficiaries in, in the future in regards to this. Um, it's often thought that forgery cases will turn on the evidence of handwriting experts and indeed um, I think handwriting experts have to be involved in any case on, on this matter and I think that their opinion is extremely valid in these cases. Um, but it's not always the key consideration this was shown in the 2001 case of Fuller and Strum and the 2007 case of Supple and Pender. They um, both succeeded in showing that the will was forged, but it was rather due to the findings of fact in the case, because in a court of law, finding of facts will always um, trump the um, any evidence or opinion of um, a, a handwriting expert because although they are an expert it's their opinion um, their expert opinion which is given and they will never trump findings of facts in a course of law as I said um, some have criticised the um, 2007 judgments of Supple and Pender for not going far enough about um, finding how the will was forged but I don't think that this is is a matter for um, a court of law. I, I think rather that they found that the, the will was valid, I, I don't think they should have turned um, investigator or private detective to find out how the will was how the will was forged. Just to find it was forged was enough. I don't think you have to go that far. I don't think in any case you have to look that far. It's not, um, it, it's not something that we should be getting involved with. It's, it's not an issue for us 
rather it's something that perhaps people want to be uh, be aware of in a, in a TV drama, but not in a, a course of law. Um, now, contentious probate and challenges to the validity of wills um, can be brought also under um, an inheritance provision for Family Independence Act. In this case, you're not necessarily challenging the validity of the will, but you, uh, somebody bringing a claim under this is wanting to challenge the will and get a redistribution of um, the estate of the deceased. Um, in this case, you don't even have to have a will um, to bring a case under the Inheritance Provision for Family Independence Act of, of 1975. It can challenge um, intestate um, estates as well. Um, now, claims under this Act can only be brought by those who are connected to the deceased, but in their opinions didn't receive reasonable financial provision from their estate. Um, so it can indeed also be brought by a beneficiary who just doesn't think that they've got enough out of the estate to maintain them. So it is, it is a very wide-ranging um, claim. Now, um, claims um, can be brought under this by either a spouse or civil partner, a former um, spouse or civil partner, provided they haven't remarried or um, given up the right to um, make any claims under this Act, or stated in the divorce that it was in full and final settlement. It can also be brought by a child of the deceased or anybody who was treated as a child of um, the um, deceased uh, or and also by anybody who was being partly or wholly maintained by the deceased. In this respect, it has um, brought claims by um, mistresses of the deceased that they want their maintenance to continue. Um, so it is it is very wide range and it can be brought by, by a lot of people. Um, they have to, claims have to be made within six months of the, down, of the date of the grant of representation, but the courts can, as always in their jurisdiction, um, increase this time limit. The, a claim can only be made under this Act where the deceased died domiciled in England or Wales. If the above are satisfied with the um, the um, person who wanted to bring the claim falls within one of these categories. Um, the deceased was domiciled in England and Wales um, at the date of death, and um, it's it's less than six months um, after the grant of representation. Then um, the court will have to decide on what will be reasonable financial provision for the party who's bringing the claim. This will differ greatly depending on the um, applicant who's bringing the claim. And um, the court will look at various considerations, the financial resource of the applicant, and um, try and weigh these against other beneficiaries, either under the, under the intestate, intestate estate or under the will. Um, and the courts will look at some issues, including the age of the applicant um, against the age of the other beneficiaries, the potential earning capacity of the applicant, again, against the um, other beneficiaries, any disability that any person may have, the size and nature of the estate, and the obligations and responsibilities that the deceased had towards the um, applicant and any others. Um, obligation and responsibilities was also, would always be seen to be greater in relation to um, somebody who was a minor rather than somebody older. They can also um, look at conduct but I think this is a very difficult one to bring in and something that the courts really don't want to be involved in. They don't want um, a big um, mudslinging match in the courts. Um, since 1996, um, cohabitees who have lived in the same household as the deceased have um, been able to gain greater success under this um, act and get um, greater um benefits from bringing claims under this Act. I think this is a general move with the times and um, various um, legislation and um, law commission reviews on uh, cohabitation rights etc. Um, as I've said the court will look at various um, factors um, including the age of the applicant, the relationship, the contribution made by the applicant to the welfare of the family um, and Really, there's, there's no strict definition of family. I think it would include um, step families and people who they treated, as indeed is said in the legislation, as children or people 
of the family. Cohabitees, however, are still not in quite a strong position as um, a spouse, as um, they will only receive provision for maintenance like, other, like any other applicant under this procedure, whereas spouses will receive greater um, provision if a claim succeeds under this rather than just for maintenance. I think the, the main crux of a successful application under this Act is the relationship of financial dependence between the applicant and the deceased. In the 1994 case of Reed Jennings, it was seen that the obligation to maintain must still be one which is still subsisting at the date of the deceased's death. I think it is a difficult one to try and bring a claim under this, but um, many people will try and bring a claim under this, basically just to um, try their luck. Um, and, <coughs> excuse me, in, in a contentious probate case, costs will be extremely high. And I think some people try and bring a claim under this just to try their luck and to try and bring about um, some provision given to them by the um, deceased estate, just um, so that it doesn't actually go to the court. Um, I think they want to do this, um, obviously for the deceased estate, it would be more beneficial to perhaps make a small allowance out of the estate rather than go to court um, because of the, the costs that will be incurred in going to court, mounting costs, um, especially the nearer you get to the trial date because this will include um, more, more counsel and, and, and barristers and, and costs will rocket at this point. So um, I think if you are um, a approached with somebody, an applicant who wants to make a claim under this, I think it is a difficult one to make, but I know some people will um, try and make a claim um, and so if you're acting on the um, reverse side of it, you're acting for the deceased estate, I know it's a difficult one because you've got to advise your clients about not only um, the applicant's possible success at trial, whether you think they've got a valid claim, but you've got to advise them as to um, potential costs that they could incur in this, in the mounting the legislation. You've got to consider that, and I think that it is um, a great evidential burden that um, any applicant has got to show, but you've got to weigh that against the cost implication, and it's a very difficult one to advise on. Also, you've got to um, advise your clients that um, the executors of an estate will generally be the beneficiaries and um, the executors, if they have a challenge brought against them on this point, will have to divulge information and that promptly so they're not um, seen to be delaying matters. So they've got to put aside some of their um, reservations about this and perhaps some anger that they may have towards the applicant um, because it's obviously depleting what they will get under the estate and act in accordance with um, the law and divulging information in this regard. So it's a difficult one to advise on, I think. Um, I, bet, I think the best thing to say is that if a client comes to you with instructions to specifically exclude a party from their will um, and you're thinking that it's somebody who they provide for and therefore I don't think that you don't think that would be valid you've got to advise them of that and even if um, it's somebody who they're not providing for and they want to um, take them out of their will and they don't want to provide for them you've got to make file notes stating why they didn't want to do that because you've got to bear in mind the potential challenges the potential challenges to the validity of wills and um, the potential um, challenges under this Act are a key concern for when anybody is drafting a will, as I spoke about in um, the first part of this talk. Now, I think um, with an ageing population and with estates growing, there's often um, much to play for in a deceased estate. And um, those who consider themselves to have a claim may want to make a challenge um, against the validity of a will on a number of aspects. I've gone through these. Um, firstly, you've got, they may want to challenge the capacity of the testator. 
Um, capacity is um, really assessed in relation to the bank and Goodfellows test, and um, you've got that how was added to with the Mental Capacity Act. And the golden rule in the whole issue of capacity is to get um, medical evidence if possible. I think when you instruct um, a medical practitioner to give you any evidence as to a person's capacity, you should be advising them that this is what you're asking them to do in relation to the will. You want to give them certain instructions. You want to make them aware that you're not just asking them to witness the will or, or something like that. They are giving an opinion as to this person's capacity. And um, I think you should give them the advice of what constitutes capacity in relation to the bank and Goodfellows test and also perhaps in relation to the Mental Capacity Act of 2005 because you want to make sure that if you're following this golden rule which was advocated in these um, earlier cases that um, it's done so properly and correctly so that if there is ever a challenge to capacity you have this there to be able to, to show. Um, then in relation to due execution, if a, if a will is executed um, correctly then Again, it's a, it's a high evidential burden to, to try and discharge this. Um, and there are various ways of, of execution, but you should also, you should always make sure that the client is executing the will correctly. I think if it's done in an office, in the solicitor's office, then obviously you're going to be able to have much more control over this. I think where a will is done um, outside, if it's done a will at home or something like that, there's, there's greater area for, for challenge on this point. Um, then I looked at um, want of, of knowledge and approval. Now I think, um, as stated, if the will is executed correctly, um, and I think there is this inherent feeling that the um, testator will have by signing their name, know what is contained in it so they will have knowledge of it and by signing their name they will have thus approved of it so again it's, it's a difficult one to show and then in regards to undue influence as was shown in the um, 2008 case of hog and hog again it's a difficult one to show um, so to succeed in a challenge of um, because anybody um, can really decide to give out their estate as they want and um, you know, it's a difficult one to show, and if a person just decides they didn't want to, it doesn't necessarily mean that they were under undue influence, it just may mean that they had a character which um, showed that they didn't want to leave their estate to a certain person. Um, forgery, I think, is an emerging area which um, will give rise to further claims with these um, do-it-yourself wills at home. Um, but as seen in some recent cases, in the most recent one of Supple and Pender of 2007, um, forgery doesn't just rely on um, expert evidence of um, handwriting experts. I think it is um, it's rather on um, issues of fact. So although it's though it's, it's it's important, it's not just necessarily on that issue, um, which may be useful for somebody who's acting against a. Um, a challenge to a, a, a capacity to, a, to sorry the validity of a will who um, is faced with um, expert evidence. Um, as shown, the inheritance provision for Family Independence Act of 1975 also provides a further avenue for um, a claim against a will if it is um, agreed that the will is, is valid. So even if the will is shown to be um, valid, there's no issues that you can challenge it on. There's also this area which the will could be challenged on which I think practitioners over both sides, when you're acting um, for um, beneficiaries, testators, um, executors, need to be aware of all the competing claims on this to really know what advice to be, to be given to clients and, and what to be aware of. Um, I think what I want to part on is um, the idea that um, practitioners in this area must be um, aware of beneficiaries with um, an ageing population and an increasingly litigious culture, many unsatisfied parties may think that lack of capacity, undue influence, forgery, want of knowledge of approval or um, not, not the correct execution of a will may be at play and um, think that this, they can try and make a, a challenge on this. 
Um, and I think that it's something that you've got to be aware of. Um, beneficiaries um, can also um, get anxious to receive the money to which they are titled. And um, I'm sure that uh, nobody really wants to hold up an estate, but where you've got challenges to the validity of will, where you've got challenges to the inheritance provision for family independence, actually you've got to really look at the whole will and um, the whole issue, the whole estate, and just, just really um, try to um, ward off the, the beneficiaries from their claims. Um, one thing I think it's advisable to do also is to do a bankruptcy search against intended beneficiaries before releasing um, funds to them, um, just really to, to check their status. And I think it covers yourself quite well. Um, and I don't think enough people really do that. Um, as I've stated all the way through this, it, it's important to take um, detailed attendance notes. Um, in any um, probate claim, each party is entitled to ask the will drafter to provide a statement. And it is a, a worrying time when any um, claim is made against yourself in this regard. So really do watch yourself in relation to the attendance notes. And I think in some firms, you've got to consider how long you keep an attendance notes for, etc. Um, and as I said, lastly, um, the inheritance provision for family independence that you've got to look at this um, if a claim is brought in relation to the the costs that could be incurred in in really fighting um, this this challenge it might be more appropriate if the to to make a, a deed of variation and give the applicant something out of the estate in full and final settlement but it's something that you're going to have to consider in relation to the size of the estate in relation to the um, the potential um, viability of that claim uh, and it's something that the, um, the executives will have to give you um, a decision on in relation to the full matter and um, in relation to um, what they want and what they thought the testator wanted and they've got to remember to act in accordance with their position as the executives and to provide all information as and, and when requested. Um, Acting in any of these matters in relation to the validity of wills can um, be highly contentious and um, multiple issues will no doubt be competing for your attention. So I think you've got to um, keep your head about you and just be aware of the potential implications that may be made in relation to any will and look, keep up to date with the, um, the case law on this because it is, it is a fast um, a fast moving area and um, something that you, you should uh, really be considering in the whole issue of um, tax and wills, tax planning, inheritance tax.